All right, welcome to today's biology review. Today we are focused on classification and phylogeny. So we have seen this picture so many times this year in our biology lessons and in our reviews, um, but I'm going to explain it one more time because it just is a great picture that just shows all of biology wrapped into one illustration. So remember, life is organized at all levels, and we can break it down to the smallest unit of life, which includes cells, all the way to the most complex part of our earth, which we call the biosphere. So in today's review, we're going to focus on the organization and the different components of life. So there's multiple ways that we can classify organisms, all of these ways we discussed this year. So uh, just remember, we can classify organisms by cell type. So are they prokaryotic cells or eukaryotic cells? We can use amino acid sequences and protein sequences to determine genetic makeup and determine if organisms are related to one another. Uh, we can use embryonic development to determine if organisms are related to one another. We can also classify organisms by the way they reproduce. So we have asexually reproducing organisms and then sexually reproducing organisms. And we discussed that in our genetics unit. Uh, we can also classify organisms by how they eat. So our autotrophs make their own food. Um, our heterotrophs have to consume their food. Physical characteristics is a way that we can classify organisms. We'll talk about that in today's uh, review and then there's other ways to other behaviors. So let's start with classifying organisms by cell type. So we also reviewed this in our sales review but it wouldn't hurt to cover it again. So prokaryotes remember are single-celled organisms that lack a nucleus. This includes bacteria and archaea. And then we have our eukaryotic cells, uh, which can include single-celled organisms, but also includes our multicellular organisms. These organisms are going to have a true nucleus in their cell. So remember, eukaryotes, U rhymes with do, they do have a nucleus. Pro rhymes with no, prokaryotes, no nucleus. Um, in our eukaryotic division, this is going to include plants and animals, fungi and protists, and we'll talk more about all those organisms in this lesson. Uh, remember, our cells are very organized, so they include organelles, and each organelle has a job. We reviewed these organelles and their specific functions in our sales review, so if you haven't already watched that review, make sure you go uh, check that out. But each of the cell organelles do their own job, but it contributes to the cell system as a whole. Now, there we've been classifying organisms uh, for many, many, many years, and the early classification systems varied greatly. So back in the day, classification was based on visual, um, visible structural differences. So like if two organisms had wings, um, earlier classifications would say, oh, these organisms must be related or share a common ancestor because they have structures that are similar. We've changed just a little bit. Now we use DNA sequences, protein sequences, amino acid sequences to help identify evolutionary relationships. So students, this is very important. You need to be able to look at organisms, compare their DNA sequences, and determine which organisms are most closely related based on those DNA sequences, or which organisms might share a common ancestor based on their DNA sequences. So what we're looking at here is we have the human, the chimpanzee, and the gorilla, and what I want you to notice is that their DNA sequences differ a little from one another because they're different organisms, but they are very similar. So what this suggests to scientists is that these three organisms share a common ancestor, and this is the DNA sequence of that common ancestor. And so because they're all very similar, um, in their nucleotide sequence, we can say that these three organisms share a common ancestor here. Now, when we're classifying organisms, when we're classifying all of life, we can break every living thing into three categories. We call these domains, and we have three domains, bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. And I told you, if you're in my class, I told you that you can remember that with bay. Um, Bay is supposed to stand for my before anything else, but we're going to change that up a little bit to help us remember the three domains. So here's a breakdown of those three domains. Our bacteria are going to be prokaryotic. Archaea is also, 
also prokaryotic. So the only domain that includes eukaryotes is the domain eukarya. Um, bacteria are going to include the good bacteria that we know about, bad bacteria. Archaea does include bacteria, but these bacteria are found in extreme environments like those hydrothermal vents, um, hot springs, and swamps. And then in our eukarya domain, these are organisms that are going to contain membrane-bound organelles. Again, this includes our plants, animals, protists, and fungi. So this year we talked about a branch of biology that deals with grouping and naming organisms. We call this taxonomy. And here you can see this is called the tree of life, this picture. So you can see the breakdown of the three domains and how all organisms kind of fall into one of these three domains. And you can go all the way back to the common ancestor that all of life shares. We also talked about the modern classification system for grouping and naming organisms. And I told you that you needed to memorize the breakdown, how life is organized. So we can start, start with the most broad category, which are our domains. Again, this includes our three domains that we discussed here, bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. And then you can break down each domain into their kingdoms and then into their respective phylums, class, order, family, genus, and then our most specific is species. And so in class, I told you that a good way to remember this is with the sentence, dumb kittens playing chicken on freeway get splatted. So you are going to have a question on your end of course assessment that's going to require you to know the order from most broad to most specific. And the best way to do that is just to memorize this sentence. So on the end of course assessment, you are going to notice that several of your questions are going to refer to organisms by their scientific name because this is a science test. So sometimes that can be a little intimidating. It's okay if you don't recognize the genus or the species names, but it is important to know that scientific name is how we um, classify organisms is how we name organisms in science. Um, so when we write scientific name, we're going to put the genus name first. The species name is going to come second. Both of these names are always italicized. Now the genus name, the, the name that comes first, is going to be capitalized. And then the species name is going to be lowercase. So you can see here Canis lupus. Um, this is the genus name. And then lupus would be the species name for this organism. We call this the wolf. Um, so the genus name is important because it implies relation, and the species name is important because it's going to be a description, but it's also going to give us a clue as to whether these organisms can reproduce viable offspring. So if I'm looking here at a wolf and a dog, I'm looking at their scientific names, and I notice that Canis is similar between both of the organisms, so they both have the same genus name. This implies relation, shows what this name tells me is that these two organisms share a common ancestor. I do notice that their species names are different, so these organisms are not going to be able to interbreed. Um, they're not going to be able to reproduce viable offspring. Here's three other organisms, so the leopard, the lion, and the tiger. You'll notice that their genus name is the same, which implies relation, uh, and then their species names are different. So do these organisms share a common ancestor? Yes. How do we know? Because their genus name is the same. Can these organisms mate and produce viable offspring? No. Um, because their species name is different. So organisms with the same species name will be able to mate reproduce and that offspring will also be able to reproduce, um, but that's not the case with these three organisms because their species name is different. Early, early this year in biology, we talked about classification of living things. So just a reminder, all living things have cells. This is where order comes in. So and they're all made of cells. All living things contain DNA or genetic information. All living things are able to reproduce. All living things grow and develop. All living things respond to their environment. All living things evolve. And all living things are able to process energy.
Um, so that brings us to viruses. So one of the things that you need to know is how viruses compare to other living things. So viruses are infectious particles that are made of a protein shell. We call this protein shell a capsid. And this capsid contains the genetic material, so the DNA or RNA. Now, viruses are not considered living because they don't meet all seven criteria for characteristics of living things. Uh, for one, they're not cells. Um, and two, they can't reproduce. They can reproduce with a host. They have to hijack the host DNA, um, but they can't reproduce on their own. Now, there are some ways that they are similar to to living organisms. So viruses do contain genetic information. They do have DNA or RNA. They do respond to their environment and they evolve. Uh, in the event that you have to uh, look at a virus and like maybe determine the anatomy, I wanted you to see some pictures, some images of some different types of viruses. Uh, notice in both of these images, they include a capsid. That capsid is just a covering that protects the genetic material. So here in this um, enveloped virus, you can see that the capsid is on the inside and it protects the DNA. Scientists believe that all life can be traced to a common ancestor. We call this the endosymbiotic theory, which we have talked about several times in our review sessions, um, but also this year in class we talked about it. So this is just the theory that one prokaryotic cell uh, ate another prokaryotic cell in the earliest forms of life, and that created our eukaryotic cells, and there is evidence to support this. So both chloroplast and mitochondria have bacteria-like properties, and so this is where scientists um, use evidence to uh, support the endosymbiotic theory. Now through speciation, so here we have a common ancestor that all life shares, and through speciation, uh, we have the evolution of different species. And then this tree of life sort of helps us comprehend in our mind how that worked out. We can use phylogenetic trees to help predict evolutionary relationships among groups of organisms. So these show speciation. We can see we have these branch points or these nodes um, that show where a new species diverged from the common ancestor and became a new species. Again, that's called speciation. And then on these phylogenetic trees, we have tips. These are called terminal nodes. They represent current organisms. Um, and they might not seem to be related. So you can, when you look at these organisms, you might think to yourself, these organisms, they don't look anything alike. They are not related. Um, but they are if they're on the phylogenetic tree because it shows that they all derived from a common ancestor and through speciation, they became new species over time. How do we determine what organisms go on these phylogenetic trees and where they belong? We use DNA sequencing. Uh, the root... So on these phylogenetic trees, if you go all the way to the bottom um, or the base, this is called the root. This is where the common ancestor lives. So this shows the common ancestor that all the organisms on the tree evolved from. And it's important to know as you move away from the root, you move forward in time. Um, this is a specific type of phylogenetic tree called a cladogram. Um, this shows how species may be related, but it includes traits. So it's very similar to a phylogenetic tree, except we're just going to include traits. So you'll notice that these organisms have these certain traits, and where these traits are is very important because any organism that is in front of that trait on the tree has that trait. For example, here we have... Um, uh, skull openings behind the eye. And so what organisms would have skull openings behind the eye? Well, anything in front of that trait. So that would be turtles, snakes, crocodiles, and birds. Uh, feathers and toothless beaks, this would include only birds. All right, that ends our um, review session for the day. Let me go back.
um, make sure that you check out the sales review. We have an evolution review. Uh, we have an ecology review and we have a genetics and heredity review. So just make sure if you haven't watched those reviews that you also go back and watch those as well.